Hi, this is Sylvie Curry from Ramona, California, and I'm listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Start the game! Let's go! We'll do it live. Okay. Well, do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike your match, and... Oh. Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. And welcome to the really big barbecue central show. This is the show that talks about all things important to the world of barbecue and grilling. Originating from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city, Bomb City, USA, Cleveland, Ohio, the barbecue capital of the North Coast. I am your program host, Greg Rempe. Happy to have you aboard here on your Tuesday evenings, a live fire fun and frivolity show. If you want to get in contact with me tonight, if you want to follow the show off hours, here's how you do all of that. You can get in touch with the show by sending an email to Greg at the BBQ Central Show dot com. Follow us on all the social media channels at BBQ Central Show. And be sure to subscribe to the show podcast feed on your favorite podcast platform. Anything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, the BBQ Central Show dot com. And here's what's happening in case you can get the newsletter coming up in about 12 minutes from now. It's the second Tuesday of the month. And in that first interview spot, you know who's coming. The creator of the most heavily trafficked barbecue grilling forums and websites ever, Meathead, from AmazingRibs.com. And then, after Meathead, another second Tuesday of the month regular guest in the first hour, the contributing barbecue editor to Southern Living Magazine. And there's a new top 50 list out there we're going to be talking about. Just released earlier today, Robert Moss from Robert F. Moss. Dot com, And that will bring a wrap to the first hour, and then we'll move to the second hour, where we have a pair of first-timers coming out of the chute first, the creator of the Rocket Fire Torch, which will be found at RocketFireTorch.com, Michael Barrar. And closing the show tonight, not to be outdone by one Michael, it is another Michael, but we're going to be talking about cellularly cultivated meat as we say a columnist for canary media michael grunwald we'll clo- i'm telling you i'm always excited for tuesday's show but the first hour we know is going to be gold the second hour is shaping up to be some of the best second hour content that we have had in recent memory maybe even all of 2023 and that's quite a lot to say considering the amount of great guests and content that we have had Over the course of this year, and we're only getting started here as we cross over what would be mid-September. So looking forward to all of that. Meathead, Robert Moss, First Hour, and then Michael Barrar, Rocket Fire Torch, and Michael Grunwald, columnist for the uh, Canary Media. And that's how the show is laying out. Don't forget, you can follow me socially, Instagram, X, TikTok, and Snapchat at BBQ Central Show. And we say good evening to those of you watching tonight through one of the video streaming platform partners. You can go to Facebook and Twitch slash BBQ Central Show to watch. Also, you can take in the show via YouTube, which is YouTube.com slash at BBQ Central Show. And of course, we do have a YouTube poll question of the week off the heels of my guest last week. And I'll leave it at there. I'm asking everybody on the face of the earth this evening. Do you believe that there is any pellet grill out there on the market that could last 100 years. And currently, and I'm surprised at this low, 82% of you are saying no. 18%, oh, it just, yeah, 18% of you are saying yes. You believe that there is some form of a pellet grill that can last 100 years? 
Wow. I'm interested to hear the makes and models of those that might be able to stretch the century mark. But that is the question tonight. So we'll ask all the guests who are going to be appearing here this evening on the lead. And then we will keep track as the show progresses. So let's start here this evening. And I have two different places that I would like to go and stick with me here. First and foremost, from the Sam the Cooking Guy segment last week. Now, I didn't really see it like this, but many of you thought that Sam was actually, for lack of a better term, angling in a rather unique way to get a free Franklin offset barbecue pit. I highly doubt that this is the case. That would certainly be an alternative way of doing things. But assuming that worked, don't you think that that puts Sam's in an incredibly awkward spot where if the unit exceeds his wildest expectations, he would now have to talk about how much he likes it after spending a number of minutes talking about how high the price was on the show last week. There's more bad looks with this than good looks. So no, I don't agree with any of you that were writing into me saying, here's what we really think. He's angling. Now, the segment, as usual, gold. By the way, I'm going to give Sam a pass on that whole portion of the segment that was talking about pricing because, while he's quite knowledgeable on a number of live fire items. And he does say this on my show fairly frequently. He's a fringe barbecue and grilling guy. And I can tell you that knowing the price of steel offset pits in today's market, not in his expert purview, to say the least. And I'll leave it at that. But I don't think we need to spend even one more second thinking that Sam's angling for a free barbecue pit. If he wants a barbecue pit, he can go buy one. And not an expert on what stuff costs, typically, especially in the offset market. Now, number two, maybe you don't want to hear about this, but it is news And it's new news. And yes, it concerns Memphis in May. And the update is this. Three days ago, on the 9th, the Memphis River Parks Partnership filed a lawsuit against Memphis in May International Festival because they have not paid the invoice that they were given for damages to Tom Lee Park post music and barbecue festival. And according to the WREG report that I was reading, MRPP did extend some extra time for Memphis and May to pay this invoice, but evidently enough time has passed to take this next step into litigation. Now, the question on everybody's mind is this. Can Memphis and May pay off? And while I have no idea what the financial situation is over there, I can't imagine that they have 550, 650, $750,000 laying around in the coffers to get right. I've been getting a lot of DMs and a lot of emails wanting to know what's next. I don't know. But the fact that the lawsuit is now filed has really made everything much more urgent in every way. I don't know if Memphis and May has gotten any word from their insurance company, because remember, they did file a claim as they stated to help either pay or offset the cost of this damage invoice that they got from Memphis River Parks Partnership. But I have no word on if that insurance company has given them any feedback, has denied the claim, has approved the claim in full. I don't know. So Memphis and May, as usual, as I'm writing emails to them, asking questions, would you like to come on the show? Would you like to give? They're not very keen on answering any or all of my emails. So The best I can tell you at this point is, A, there is a now lawsuit filed, which is unfortunate. B, I have no word from Memphis and May on what they're going to be doing, but typically that's their MO. Once they want to talk about it, they'll get back in touch with this WREG, which is probably the local newspaper out there in Memphis, and tell them what they want to do first. Then typically I'll get an answer back a couple days later. But we will track it. But there is a lawsuit. Somebody's going to have to be paying. And what happens if they don't pay? Certainly, this is as bad as it can go at this point. 
I didn't think we would get to this stage of events, but we are we are here. We are effing here as it relates to the Memphis River Parks Partnership and the Memphis and May International Barbecue Festival. We will continue to track as it goes. Jill and Georgia writing in to the show. Greg, I have been in the live fire cooking for the last five years. Just found your show a few months ago. If you're looking for input on potential guests being a woman, I would like to hear from more women. I think the show is very good so far. Regards, Jill. Jill, input taken and duly noted. Mike in New Jersey writing in, Greg, lab-grown meat will never be a thing here in the States, no matter how much the whiny environmentalists cry for it. For me, it's real meat or GTFO. And I think a lot of real red-blooded Americans feel the same way. Love the show. Podcast only regards Mike. Well, okay. We got Meathead in the green room. He's ready to rock. Before we get to Meathead, let's learn a little bit about Pits and Spits. Are you tired of settling for mediocre grilling experiences? Yes, you are. It's time to step it up. Bring the ultimate flavor and the ultimate cooker to the backyard barbecues. Pits and Spits Charcoal Grills offering the highest quality live fire cooking experience you can get in the market today. Using either wood or charcoal, their solid fuel grills produce those classic flavors you're looking for when you have time to fire up the grill and cook for family and friends. With a large adjustable fuel tray, you can raise and lower the fire control and fine tune the heat. This is their version of, let's say, a Santa Maria style cook. And by the way, if you've been on the website, you've looked at the charcoal grills, you know you can fit, pardon my French, an F load of food on this. You can cook in many different ways. Again, you can raise that charcoal tray all the way up if you want to sear off 15 or 20 steaks at one time. Or if you want to lower that food tray, go a little bit more of the traditional low and slow. You can bank the fuel off to one side. You can put the meat on the opposite side, cook indirect or two zone. It's very flexible, very nimble for a cooker. Check them out online, pitsandspits.com slash Central. That's pitsandspits.com slash BBQ Central and use promo code Charcoal Central for 150 bucks off any charcoal grill as you're ordering. Again, that's Charcoal Central at checkout for 150 bucks off any charcoal grill and then the website pitsandspits.com slash BBQ Central. And the pits and spits is spelled with the double T on both. The double T on the pits and the double T on the spits. Meathead joins us next. Sit around. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Show studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. All right, welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by CookinPellets.com, your number one source for quality wood pellets for all your pellet-driven cookers. After you're done perusing the offerings at cookandpellets.com and you're ready to buy, go to walmart.com or lowes.com or Walmart Lowe's. It's another big box store. What's bigger than Walmart, though? Great shipping rights there. A lot of the time, shipping's included. So again, that's the great folks over at cookandpellets.com. Before we get to Meathead... I do want to show this. You would remember at some point last month, I actually forget what date it was, but the show crossed over the 3 million total downloads mark. And my parents sent me this very nice uh, commemorative gift right here. You can see this is a uh, microphone with a headset resting over. It's uh, metal. It's got LED lights on it. And at the bottom it says Barbecue Central Show, 3 million downloads. So I did want to... Give them some thanks and recognition for 
recognizing the fact that the show has crossed its threshold at that three million. We kind of blew right over it, and we're already fifty thousand new downloads into this whole thing. But uh, thank you, mom and dad, and my sister Kate for giving me that piece of recognition that's now right here in the studio. All right, joining me now, the creator of AmazingRibs.com, your friend and mine, it is Meathead from AmazingRibs.com. Meathead, where's that microphone at? I don't see it anywhere near you, and that makes me very scared. Yeah, oh, well, it's okay. blocking my yeah. logo, you oh, see. Right, yeah, you gotta... No, it's not. Oh, oh, I see. Hello, shirt. Centralites. Yes, like nobody Hello, knows Centralites. who Meathead is. You're from AmazingRibs.com, the founder, of course. And we are always excited to talk to Meathead on the second Tuesday. We have a YouTube. Congratulations on three million. Yeah, thank you. We're on our way yeah. to four million, as it were. We have we, a, uh, we average two million page views a month. A month. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. How many downloads do you get a month? I don't know. You know nobody downloads a winner. Just, we have a YouTube bad. poll question of the week, Meathead. We're asking everybody this, and I need your input. Yeah. Ferociously, I need it. Do you believe that any pellet grill could last 100 years? Yes or no? Well, theoretically, I mean, let's count backwards 100 years to 1923. There are cars and airplanes still flying from that era, but they're really, uh, you know, I mean, they're constantly being replaced. Parts are being replaced and repaired. I mean, I've had numerous pellet smokers and, uh, uh, they got a lot of moving parts and uh, they got a heating element and things burn out and break. Um, I know this Weber, for example, maintains a huge um, parts inventory. If you've got a 20 year old Weber Genesis and you need a part, they probably still have it. Now let's keep in mind the Weber kettle was first introduced in 48 or 49 um so you know we're going back quite a ways my gut instinct is is the you know it it, it might last 100 years but it's going to need parts it's going to need repairs and will the manufacturers still be in existence will traeger still be there in 100 years will will be will we be interested in cooking on pellets will they be another you know pellets really are just the past 10 years in popularity will something surpass it i don't know maybe they'll last probably they'll need a lot of parts we had we've said a lot but it's a yes or no question do you think it lasts 100 years um no without repairs no uh currently 86 percent of centralites voting on the youtube poll question of the week are also with you saying that no they don't believe that any type of pellet cooker will last 100 years and we'll track the further progress, and we'll ask our other guests here this evening. I'll be interested to hear what Robert well, we'll, Moss has. We'll come to say. back in a hundred years and see. You know, I mean, I plan to be here. <laughs> of course, <laughs> you'll be one hundred and seventy. Uh, a month ago, we were talking about how excited we were to once again meet up in person. You were doubly yeah. excited to break my oh, I've never yeah. been to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame streak as it's only 10 minutes away from my house. And then we were going to go to the local restaurant, Larder Delicatessen, where we would eat like kings and you would be able to have some conversation with the person who's widely considered to be one of the foremost Koji experts uh, in all the globe, mm -hmm. not only nationally, but globally. Yeah, man, that I highly respect. I was really. Oh, dear. So what, what you want happened? Me to tell the story? Can you take it from here, please? Yeah, I'll take it from here. <laughs> um, I, Greg and I planned this whole day. I was going to fly into Cleveland early. We were going to go to the Hall of Fame. Then we were going to go to Jerry Ermansky's uh, larder. Yes. And we were going to taste a lot of stuff that had been treated with Koji and talk to Jeremy and learn more about Koji because I've been writing about it and fiddling with it. And we we're going to have a great meal. And then I was going to drive out to Milan, Milan, Milan. Or Milan, Milan, Ohio, which is about an hour, an hour and a half east, west of Cleveland, where there's a big vegetable farm. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I was participating in cooking for, catch this, I'm cooking for a culinary vegetable institute. I was, but I was <laughs> cooking steak. Um, they had to have some sort of beef. <laughs> yes. In any case, um, 
So I'm, I'm going through security at O'Hare, and I'm just carrying a small duffel bag, and I have with me a bottle of my red meat rub. Just this size bottle, about the size of a beer can, yep. and it's in my duffel bag. And they scan, you know how they scan stuff. They, they scan my bag, and they pull me aside. And they open the bag, and they take this out. And did I, I sent you a picture. You got it handy? Can you show it? There it is. They put it on the table, and they pull out four little squeeze bottles and a whole bunch of reagents and tests, and they start swabbing it and testing it, and it comes up positive for explosives. Hence, now, highly explosive not barbecue hot rub. pepper in the goddamn thing. <laughs> That's positive for explosives. Wow. Next thing I know, the bomb squad is there. I'm standing there. They got the bomb squad oh. circling around me. They're testing my rub. They open it, and I just just take the goddamn stuff. Nope, nope. They they're not going to let me of course get not. away. Huh. And so now they're, they, they broke the seal. It was a fresh bottle that had never been opened. They, they broke the seal. They're sniffing it. They're testing it. They're swabbing it. Finally, after about 30 minutes, they decide it is in fact. And I, I got my AmazingRibs.com barbecue shirt on. I hold it up, and there's my picture on the label next yeah. to my face. See, that's me. That's me. It, <laughs> and I missed my friggin' flight. Yeah. <laughs> So our trip to the barbecue hall, to the um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, <laughs> we got the uh, the kibosh. I didn't get in in time, but we still had a fantastic visit with Jerry Mansky at Jeremy Mansky at uh, Larder. If you're in the Cleveland area, and God knows why you'd go there, if you're in the Cleveland area, that place is a special trip. He is really a fascinating, talented chef, and he's really deep into koji, which is a, um, a, a mold, essentially, full of enzymes that really interestingly alters flavors um, and in, enhances flavors. And I'm writing about it for my new book. And so and also for the website, we've got we'll have some stuff on the website about it soon. So just go to AmazingRibs.com and type in K-O-J-I, and you'll see what I've written about it. Fascinating stuff. We had a great time. It was just a lot of fun to hang with Greg again. We've done this maybe a half a dozen times yeah, now. Yeah, a lot. Um, and uh, uh, we ate well. Boy, has he got oh some my fascinating God. I mean, he, he was just bringing and out nice food time. after food after food. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, I, yeah. I, he was determined to let us taste everything yes. in, the, uh, in the restaurant. Uh, and what a nice guy, too. I mean, he just sat down with us, and he can talk. He can talk more, more than I can. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. good. Yeah, he's yeah, So he what, good. what I like best about Jeremy is he's somebody, for me, uh, as I told Sam, the cooking guy last week, I'm not necessarily an overly adventurous eater. I'm not going to not try stuff, but I wouldn't classify myself as being like a, a risky eater by any stretch of the imagination. But when I'm in his facility... I always feel inspired to get outside of my comfort zone. When he handed me, uh, you know, a couple months ago, he handed me a spoonful of duck heart and duck testicle paste that had been made with Koji. Like, of course, in my mind, I'm like, there's no way I'm going to eat this, but he's got it right in front of me. Am I going to say no and offend him? So, of course, I and then it's delicious. It's salty. There's all kinds of magic going on. And uh, mm -hmm. what he really, so aside from the, the cooking chops, uh, unquestioned, but he really excels at educating, explaining, here's the process. This is why we're doing it. This is why we can use the whole side of beef. This is why we can use the whole lemon or the whole lime instead of just taking the sweet or juicing it. There's no waste. Real big on not wasting stuff. How Koji helps with all mm -hmm. of that. So when I bring my kids in, we get to eat great. They love the food, but they're also getting this great culinary lesson from somebody who was a leader in the field. They think I'm a big shot because they know them, but you they're getting your educated. Kids there. Yes, of course. Because I remember one of your daughters came to Chicago with you. One yeah, time. Maddie. Yep. She was a volleyball star and competing in a volleyball competition. And we went to Chinatown together. And she had a ball. She loved the food. Oh, yeah. But I got the impression that she's not, uh, by nature, a very adventurous no, eater. She and is she not. Doesn't, 
you know, the idea that she went to a Korean barbecue restaurant was just way outside of her normal uh, performance. So getting her into a deli, and it's a Jewish deli, only he veers from the traditional catches and Carnegie yeah. style because of his use of Koji. And we, we've we talked about Koji before, and that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. But 30 seconds for anybody who doesn't know what the hell we're talking about. Koji is a mold that's grown on rice usually, and um, uh, you inoculate it with some water, and once it takes off, it creates a whole bunch of enzymes. And if you sprinkle it or pour it or marinate meat or vegetables with it, the enzymes alter the flavor, just like um, pineapple has enzymes in it, and so does uh, kiwi and other things, and it alters the flavor. And I did a really fun experiment when I came back. I marinated uh, chicken thigh. I took three chicken thighs. One I just salt and peppered. The other I did with uh, MSG, and the other with koji. And it, all three were vastly different. Um, I preferred the koji. My wife preferred the MSG. Um, the plain one was just fine, but the other two really amped up the flavors. And uh, koji is uh, uh, an aspergillus that they use to make sake with and to make soy sauce and uh, miso. They're all used. They're all made with koji, so it's not too weird. Um, it was a lot of fun and a lot, a lot of educational, and I'll have some good info about it on the website and in my new book. We had maybe a couple months ago, I had briefly touched on the topic. Maybe it was even off air about cellularly cultivated meat. You turned me on to a lady who you thought was kind of a, a leading expert, somebody that could talk about it. She declined and then gave me a lead to this Michael Grunwald, who's going to be closing the show tonight. Mm -hmm. And he's a writer for Canary Media, uh, Politico, multi-award winner. Uh, Harvard graduate, so I don't know why he's going to be on this show, but I've tricked him enough, <laughs> and we're going to be talking about it tonight. Do you have any I'm aware. rudimentary thoughts on this new meat craze of cell-cultivated beef? Well, um, first of all, I introduce you to Tamar Haspel. Tamar yeah. writes this marvelous um, uh, award-winning column in the Washington Post. It appears only in the Washington Post and on AmazingRibs.com. She writes... Well, we get we get reprint rights on our site. She's brilliant. She really knowledgeable about the science of food and cooking and also about um, health and diet. And so I, I knew that you were interested in exploring this. And I know she's written about it. I introduced you to her and she felt although she knows a lot about it, she would introduce you to somebody who knew more about it. Now, I have some general opinions, but I don't know a lot about it. I, I, I was interested to hear the comment you read from your listener about no way in hell am I ever going to eat it. Yeah, yeah it, it's going to happen. It's going to take a while because it's really expensive to make the stuff now. And if I mean, I've done this. If you go to Burger King and buy the impossible Whopper and a regular Whopper, take them home. Take the patty out from the center, rinse it in the sink, and taste the two side by side. I mean, I've heard people say it tastes just like a Whopper. It doesn't taste anything like a Whopper. Oh. When you do um, ketchup and mayonnaise and mustard and shredded lettuce and pickles and uh, sesame bun, yeah, you can mistake the two. But it, 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 it's, it, it's a vast improvement over the soybean patties that I ate, you know, 10 years ago. And, you know, the, 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 there are um, reasons why it makes sense. It is much easier on the environment. Um, there are overheads. I mean, it's very expensive to build and produce this faux meat. I think that, you know, we will be eating it, but not a lot of it. I think that uh, it's like... Um, there's food out there that we love to eat today. Well, I'm all right. I'm just off the top of my head. I'm thinking All right. 20 years ago, nobody ever saw a red bell pepper. I mean, it was all green bell peppers. Now there's red and orange and yellow. Our, our food supply is uh, um, edamame um, as uh, soybean pods. There were a lot of fun. Nobody ever ate a soybean pod five years ago. Um, so our, our, our diet and what we eat is constantly changing, and this will find a niche in it. 
for some people, it'll become very important. For other people, they won't come near it. And that's just the way it works. I, I you know, I, I look forward to them improving the flavor. To me, the difference here. So a lot of people have had the opportunity to try an impossible or beyond. That's plant based. It's not meat meat. But what we're talking about tonight is technically meat. It's finding a cow or a chicken or fish or whatever extracting cells and then i don't i don't i don't know how the hell it's happening scientifically but i mean i in all argument's sake like that's real fish or chicken well that's another meat that's a whole nother story you can actually do that you can you know take a human being and pluck stem cells from it how many how many of us remember back under the uh George Bush administration, when we had a uh, uh, a woman from Alaska saying, you know, uh, this was ridiculous and we can't have it. But you can take stem cells from an animal or a- other cells and grow them. And uh, they're doing this now. I've uh, there Israel is is a uh, Korea. There there's several plants that are doing this nicely. And again, it's going to be very expensive. It will be real meat. It won't be faux meat like Impossible or uh, the others. Uh, it, it's real meat. Again, it's going to be very expensive to produce, at, at least at the outset. But with time, the cost will come down. I mean, I remember the first iPhone. I bought the first iPhone. <laughs> Apple introduced a new one today. Yeah. Uh, the prices, uh, the price, I mean, you know, everybody has, has, a, has, a, has, a, has a computer in their pocket. Um, they'll come down and it should, in theory, taste the same as real chicken and real beef because it is real chicken and real beef. Just going to take a long time. And I shouldn't, you know, expound any further because you have the real expert coming on later. When is the refire of the uh, flat top king going on your fireside chat? Oh, um, we're, I, I do a live um uh broadcast uh um once a month on the final thursday of every month uh, simulcast on facebook and youtube we're going to move it to wednesday so we don't compete with thursday night football and next next month the last wednesday of the month um we have um neil coming on he's the flat top king this is a guy who used to be a navy chef (laughs) <laughs> working on a stainless steel flat top for a living. I mean, he did it every day. And he's talked to me about how, you know, their procedures for cleanliness. Oh, my goodness. Um, and I've talked to him at length because I'm doing a lot of fiddling with griddling now. Yeah, I've same. always griddled. I've always had a uh, lodge cast iron griddle that I've used. And I use it primarily for salmon and other things. But now, you know, I've expanded my horizons and you can do a lot of stuff on a griddle. And I'm not talking now to turn to your audience because I bet a lot of your audience knows about these griddles. Oh, for sure. The griddle grills, if you want to call them, they're freestanding. They have two, three, four burners and a big old steel flat top or stainless steel or uh, cold rolled steel or cast iron. And it's the same thing that um, they cook on at Moe's Diner and Grill. And uh, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. You can do, and if you get good at it, you know, if you're juggling, you can do the meats on one side and the eggs on another side and the rice in the middle and chop and toss and turn and chop, 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 toss, 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 toss. And, uh, you know, guys who are good at this cook up a storm. I'm learning how to do this. My biggest issue with it is, and this is something I'm going to be writing more about, is the cleanup. These things are just a friggin' pain to get clean. When I'm done cooking on a stovetop, I toss the pan in the sink and scrub it, and I'm done. This is just like a giant frying pan, and it gets dirty. And um, if you're using cast iron or steel, they're really hard to clean. And if you've cooked fish in there, the fish oils get into the seasoning Mm. on the surface. So cleaning is an issue, and I expect that we'll talk a lot about this on the last Wednesday right. of this month. Well, I'll be looking forward to that, so tune in. Otherwise, you go to AmazingRibs.com, and you see him here on the second Tuesday of every month. Meathead, always appreciate the time, but we'll see you in October. 
Always fun to talk to you, Greg. And uh, congratulations on the Browns. Yes. Thank you. Hopefully the Chicago Bears will find their winning ways with Justin Fields. We'll see. Thought he was going to be the answer, and now he's a question mark. So we will move on from there. The Browns 1-0 and for those that are counting. Yes. Robert Moss is getting ready to join us here in just one moment. And before we get to him, we'll talk to you about Primo Cookers. Just this past weekend, Primo had their Primo Bash in Poplar Bluff, Illinois. If you know where the middle of nowhere is, then that's where Poplar Bluff is. And the Primo Factory out there in Illinois. I was following it on social media. I had plans to be out there, but it was uh, kind of a challenging weekend for me, so couldn't do it. But here's what I know. There's a lot more social media talent there than there was last year at the flagship event. There's a lot more people going in general in attendance. There's now a cooking competition. There's tours through the factory. I don't know if you can get tours to just show up every day of the week. You can get a tour or not. I'll have to check with Nick on that. But there's no doubt about it. Next year, assuming it's all right on my schedule, I'm going. There's no reason not to go. I would suggest that you go as well. Put it on a calendar. This is about the time it happens every year in September. And it's growing. This could be some type of a sanctioned barbecue event with the amount of people that were there. And then big time social media stars were there. Scott Thomas from Grilling Fools. Uh, Other folks that I can't remember right off the top of my head, but they have very large social media accounts. So if you place importance on that, which a lot of people do, then probably have the chance to meet them and talk. But the bottom line is you're going to the factory. You're seeing how these are made. There's a really cool kiln demonstration that is online, and you can view that for yourself. Then I'm sure there's deals where if you want to bring a truck, these things are heavy. Don't try and lift an extra large up by yourself like me and then hurt your arm. You have to go to physical therapist. You can find one at a dealer near you. Go to primogrill.com and then search for the closest dealer to you and then check out all the sizes of ovals. Uh, I recommend the extra large. That seems to be a great QPR or quality price ratio. And I'm using it all the time. Oh my God, it's so great. The ceramics are great. It really provides a much more humid cooking environment than you would ever believe if you've never cooked on one before. Go to primogrill.com, find the dealer near you, grab one today, bring help. Don't grab it by yourself, as I had mentioned. And then get all the accessories too, because they've really caught up in that regard as well. It's a great cook. Primogrill.com, longtime sponsor of the show. Happy to have them aboard. And we'll be back with Robert Moss right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. Howard Stern, Jim Rome, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rempe. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. And we thank Meathead for joining us the last segment, and this portion being brought to you by Fireboard. If you're looking for a remote thermometering system that can accommodate six inputs, you can rotate between internal meat probes and smoker pit temps if you would like. Doesn't matter. You can track it on your computer, track it on your phone. Fireboard is a place to go. And then, of course, they have that instant read meat thermometer and one channel fireboard combo called the Spark. You got to check that out for 150 bucks or less. Can't beat it. Great thermometer. I just used it tonight on some chicken. So check out fireboard.com. My next guest tonight is the other first Tuesday of the month in the first hour guest. Always 35 past, the contributing barbecue editor to Southern Living Magazine. Robert Moss and boy do we have a lot to talk about here Robert so before we get yeah, to we that sure do, Greg. Uh, no doubt before we get to that we have a YouTube poll question of the week that I'm getting everybody's thoughts on which is this do you believe any pellet cooker can last 100 years yes or no no well I appreciate your directness and not <laughs> pussyfooting around it like our pal Mita did a couple minutes ago uh, I mean, I'm with him conceivably in a museum or something, but no, I don't think you're going to be, I don't think anybody's grandkids are going to be using their pellet cooker a hundred years. 
75% of the YouTube voting public are in agreement there as well, saying no, they don't believe that Pellet Cooker can go 100 years, and I'm on that line of thinking as well. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into it here. Here's a different question before we talk about the uh, top 50 list. Would you pay 60 bucks a year to have access to some of the biggest barbecuers on social media? Yes or no? I feel like I don't know enough to answer that question. Six. What, what do you mean by access to the biggest social media influence? So you have so uh, who get? Uh, look, I, I, I don't know who you consider to be the biggest <laughs> social. But when I'm reading about that, these are big names that you would see on YouTube. Yep. They have huge followings on Instagram. They appear to be very accomplished barbecue cooks in their own right. Uh, some of them highly mechanically uh, trained, the uh, building stuff. So all these people have been assembled and they've launched their own streaming platform called Ember TV. I'll talk about that in the second hour a little bit. And they're charging 60 bucks to have access to all the content. So knowing that, are you spending 60 bucks a year? Oh, when you say access, just to be able to see all the content. Yes. Yeah, you got to pay to play. Uh, uh, highly unlikely. We call that no where I come from. Robert Moss is joining <laughs> well, I us I need here. to know more what the content is is about, but there's so much. Well, I mean, I would I, imagine it. I'm not sitting here thinking I have no way to get access to good uh, barbecue and live fire content today uh, for free. So I'm not sure where the what the 60 bucks gets me. I'm assuming, and I've reached out to some of the bigger names that are supposed to be a part of this. I don't know where the ownership stuff lies or responsibility, but some of the folks I've had on the show previously and would like to have them on to talk about some of the questions uh, like you're asking. But I would imagine this is all how to cook this, or this is my method, yeah. or this is Robert's method on cooking a brisket, and then I'm part of the thing. This is Greg's method on cooking a brisket. This is how you run a fire in an offset pit, or this is how you run a lot of stuff like this. As you said, easily you could say you go on YouTube and find the 70 or 100,000 other free options, but then you have to weigh who are you watching in relation to this team that is assembled embers tv and where their expertise lies so we'll leave it there for now contributing barbecue editor to southern living magazine last month we were like well right about this time next month which is now you could be seeing the top or the new top 50 barbecue joints for southern living magazine it was released a little bit earlier today as people were yep. feverishly sending me the like, did you see this in case you didn't know i'm like you know i know the guy right <laughs> i may have i may have, have totally previewed right. in the last that's segment right i mean show. come on um <laughs> before we get into the southern living top 50 i get an email from a listener a month or so ago and it involved potted meat <laughs> and this was a semi-recurring topic on the show for the last number of months do you have a a history or a track on said potted meat by chance uh yeah i do i was actually worried that potted meat was going away for a while it, it seemed to fade out but I'm, you I'm were worried it's, it's yeah I was glad it's, it's come back around i thought people had forgotten about it because we were we would talk we, we had sort of had to um, bounce around as an idea to talk about for a while um but yeah i do actually have a a, a potted history of potted meat if you will um what we know is potted meat, at least what you were experienced sitting on that airplane to your, your great delight, uh, is sort of the 20th century incarnation of potted meat. But it actually is, it started off as a very different type of thing. Um, it's sort of the English version of pate or confit or something like that, which is it, it's a it's a meat preservation technique dating back to before refrigeration. So you cooked a big roast or you know some kind of meat and you have a bunch left over. You don't have a refrigerator because it's the 19th century. Um, how, how do you preserve it? Um, well, what you would do is you would chop up all that meat very fine into, into little bits. You would uh, mix it with a bunch of spices, pour over it uh, some kind of fat like butter or lard or something like that, and then actually bake it in a pot so like in a stoneware pot, hence the meat is potted. Uh, and then at the end, pour melted butter or lard over the top, mm -hmm. which if you know, is sort of still a technique uh, used for charcuterie of, of, various, of various types. And then you could set it away in a cool area, meaning somewhere in the shadows, but not in the refrigerator. And your meat would stay good for you know days or even weeks because that layer of fat and all the spices and everything would, would preserve it. <laughs> so that was sort of the 19th century version of potted meat. Um, 
around this. And I, I looked into this after I heard it on your show because I was like, okay, well, how do we get from that? Because I sort of knew about that to the, the can of meat that's sitting on the plane. And, uh, you yeah, <laughs> know, the guy probably paid 79 cents for yeah, it. Yeah, right. Uh, with, with hopefully got some free saltines with it. Um, well, that happened around the turn of the 20th century. So around 1900 or so, um, as the meat packing industry was developing, uh, particularly in Chicago, uh, they started, they took this thing, potted meat, and made an industrial version of it, which was to take all the leftover scraps of meat. So not mm-hmm. like leftover in the sense that we had a roast we ate last night, we're going to dice it up, but all the pieces that you would carve off that you, know, you may not want to eat and dice it up real fine and mix it in. And then you put it in a can and then you would actually you know, cook it in the can, steam it in the can, uh, and then sell it as, as potted meat. And so it, probably the, you know, this is literally using up every last scrap, getting every last scrap of profit out of your, your packing house. The actually, um, I found a report from the sanitary in, in, inspector of the city of Chicago, who in 1906 was investigating all these cases of food poisoning. And what happened was people would go buy canned potted meat, take it home, open the can, eat a little bit of it and just leave it sit down on the counter, which is how you would do your preserved potted meat. Uh, but this other pot of meat wasn't preserved in any way. It just been sort of like cooked in a can hmm. um, and it went bad and people w- were getting sick left and right. And they have been ever, ever since. So that's basically uh, the history of, of, of potted meat in a, in a nutshell. And uh, from a olfactory emanation. It stinks. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Just terrible. And if you look at the ingredients of potted meat, it's uh, yeah, it's pork parts and chicken parts and things you you just don't even want to know what, what goes in that can. Today, the list is out, and you can go to southernliving.com slash barbecue restaurants, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff. But if you go to or probably uh, Robert Moss website, there's probably a link there as well. Yeah, go to robertfmoss.com, and the link is right there at the top of the page. We could go through all 50, but we certainly don't have the time. Let's talk generally to me about 50 to 11, and then we'll reveal the top 10 for those that haven't looked yet. Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of the, the list. You know, we, we took a big break over COVID. And so 2022 was the list coming back after, I think, three years. And, um, you know, it, it, just in terms of who's in the top 50 and who's not, that didn't change a whole lot. A few people fell out. A few people moved in, um, but not not that many different. And more, it's just people shuffled around. Um, I think, though, this year, one two, two things happened. One is I really went back and over the past year, really wanted to visit the very top of the list and make sure that I, I revisited everyone who was in sort of the top 10. Tried to get all the top 20 and make sure I revisited them again. Um, and, you know, just to you know, see how things were, were shaking out. And then I really just the more as I thought about the list itself and, and, and just as context, this particular list is chosen 100 percent by me uh, with no real input. I mean, I, I take input from lots of people on where I should go visit, but I don't it, it's, it's not a team effort, you know, in terms of, of compiling the list. This is the editor's list. So it's very personal. It very much reflects my own, you know, tastes and, and, and preferences. Um, but this time around, I really focused on um Regionality, as I think I said in the introduction, I really tried to tighten the screws down a lot more on on regionality. And if you look at the top fifty, like who's who deserves to make it? The problem is there's so many good restaurants out there, and the bubble, as I would call it, to make the fifty is huge. And there are lots of restaurants there just you know keep ticking over. And ultimately, I had to figure out, okay, so what what sort of gets you over? Um, ultimately, I'm saying if you if you have to only if you you know. If you can only visit 50 restaurants, I try to give a representative sample. If you've eaten all 50 of these, you sampled all the different styles. You've eaten at places that are very influential, historically speaking, that really represent what's going on in their region or what's going on sort of like with the sort of modern trends and things like that. So it's not just that it's a good restaurant. It, it, every, everyone, everybody to make the list has to be a good restaurant. The food has to be good. But there has to be something about the experience that's unique and it's different and it's sort of you know, it has influence or stands out some way. So I think that that shifted a lot and it put some, took some people off and put some, some, some restaurants on that weren't on there before, uh, just in that sort of 11 to 50. But again, particularly once, you know, making that 50, it, it could easily be a top 100 list. There's, there's so many great candidates. Um, it's not like I had trouble, you know, 
making the 50, figure out who made the 50. <laughs> or uh, the, I didn't have to struggle to get 50. Yeah. It was it's like struggling to who to leave off was, was the hardest the hardest question of that. So let's take it from 10 and work our way down to number one. Uh, coming in 10th spot is B.E. Scott's Barbecue, not to be confused with either Rodney Scott's Barbecue or Scott's Barbecue. So what makes B.E.'s unique? Yeah, it gets confusing because uh, you also hear it called Scott's Parker's, Scott Parker's Barbecue or Par- Parker's Barbecue. Um, B.E. Scott founded it, I think, in the 1960s uh, in Lexington, Tennessee. There are lots of Lexingtons in the barbecue world. Small town, sort of in the middle of Tennessee, about you know 45 minutes off of, of I-40 if you're heading through, through Tennessee. Uh, run today by Zach Parker, uh, who is the son of, uh, well, the son of, of uh, I think, Early Parker. Uh, and B.E. Scott originally founded it. So uh, Zach is sort of keep is the third generation of, of the of the restaurant today. Um, it they are a practitioner of the West Tennessee whole hog style, mm-hmm. which was huge about 30, 40 years ago. Uh, only a handful of whole hog joints left in West Tennessee and they're doing it the old way. So it, it's just so A, it's it represents this this style. B, it's just a fantastic place off the side of the road, low key, quiet operation uh, and the, bar- the barbecue is fantastic. W- wonderful um, West Tennessee style hog. Would accompanying West Tennessee representatives also be somebody like a, a Pat Martin's or a, a Peg Leg? Yeah, or no? the, both. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so okay. Pat Martin will tell you he is um, very much. I mean, that's sort of the, that that's the region he was inspired by, and he is following the the West Tennessee style as is is Peg Leg. Peg Leg is a little bit more of a mix of. Memphis and yeah. West Tennessee, which isn't exactly the same thing, but both of them cook whole hogs and and those are the restaurants they sort of went to growing up that they are sort of, you know, keeping the, you know, following the tradition of. Number nine is the current number one on Texas Monthly's list, which is Goldie's Barbecue. Why number nine and not higher? Uh, I can't. I mean, if you ask me, if I had to rank them tomorrow, it probably they, these would switch up, right? They're so close; it's so hard, hard to say. Um, I can tell you, I can't tell you why nine and not eight, or but I can tell you why it's in the top ten. Um, it is a new, relatively new place. It was literally founded uh, probably a month before COVID. I think February twenty twenty two by five really young pitmasters, yep. all of whom had cooked in various great Texas restaurants. Um, and then decided to open a barbecue joint of their own. And of course, then COVID hit and they sort of limped through. And then uh, Texas Monthly put them at, in the number one and they sort of blew up and have uh, been going strong ever since. Um, for me, I just was, am super impressed by every single thing on the menu is, is excellent, mm-hmm. you know, top notch. Um, just from the, the you know, brisket to ribs to, to sausage, but also they make their own bread. So, but not fancy bread. It's, it's white loaves, just like classic, uh, uh, Texas, uh, you know, for Texas white bread, pickles, everything. So it's just like, it's just flawless, I would say. So it's a superlative barbecue. And, you know, again, I can't say why it's, you know, nine versus 10 versus eight, but it is certainly a top 10 barbecue. Eight is Lewis barbecue. Yeah, Lewis is of an unusual one because I, 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 not unusual, but it's it's sort of the exception that proves a rule when I'm talking about regionality. So Lewis Barbecue is a you know Texas style barbecue in the heart of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, here I am. Normally I'd be like, well, you should be cooking pig, and uh, you know here here in Charleston, the difference is that John Lewis just everything he makes is 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 it's sort of like Goldie's. I mean, everything is is really really excellent. Um, he has a large scale operation. Um, is good of sausage and brisket, you know, as good of Texas style barbecue as you'll find anywhere in Texas. In fact, he cooked at Aaron Franklin's and then was the pit master at La Barbecue in Austin b- before he came to Charleston. So certainly a strong pedigree. Um, what I like about it, maybe what puts it, kicks it up into that upper echelon, he brought all the best things of Texas barbecue and left the bad things behind. Uh, I went there on a Friday. I think I walked in at 1155 uh, in the morning. Um, I waited in line for, I think about 12 minutes oh. and, uh, was at the front of the line, getting my barbecue and sitting down and eating it. Nice. Unlike the three to four hours you would spend in, you know, you show up at, at noon at a Texas barbecue joint yeah. on, a, on a Friday, yeah. you know, good, good luck. So he's got this system down. You, you can go eat there at nine o'clock at night and they're still carving fresh barbecue. So it's, it's, it's everything that makes Texas barbecue great. And then, and then better. 
Seven is Lexington Barbecue, which, of course, if you if you know anything about that, it's a Wayne Monk establishment. Yes. I mean, the, you, you got to sort of hit all the, the styles, and the Piedmont North Carolina style is one of the just classic you know, American barbecue styles. I, for me, Lexington Barbecue is probably the quintessential representative. I think Stamey's in Greensboro is a few spots down the list. I think they're, they're, they're very close, but if you want to sample that style, you, you go to, you go to Honey Monks, as they still call it. Uh, in fact, the name is Lexington Barbecue, but it was originally called Honey Monks when it first opened in the 60s. Uh, Long time customers still write checks to Honey Monks, uh, oh. and they still cash them, apparently. Uh, local checks only, please. Um, but it's just a fantastic, classic Piedmont style, chopped pork, so that tomato vinegar sauce, mm-hmm. red slaw, uh, hush puppies, you know, it's it's just a, it's a classic. Six is also a longtime classic, Skylight Inn. Yeah, go to the other side of North Carolina, to the eastern North Carolina, to Aden. And again, it's just, a, a there's no place quite like it. Um, first you pull up and it's like this oct- or hexagonal building, maybe it's octagonal, uh, driving that dates back to the 1950s. Somewhere in the 80s, uh, the, the Jones family erected a dome on top, like the Capitol Dome, because uh, I think it was National Geographic Magazine called them the cap the, the you know, the world's barbecue capital. So they put a, a capital on top of it. Um, and they still, if you go around the back, you'll see this gigantic mound of wood, mm. uh, probably, you know, hun- hundreds of square feet uh, of wood. I don't know how many cords it would be. They're still cooking the old school way, whole hogs on, on, on uh, open pits. They bring them, they chop them. Um, you, the classic sort of iconic skylight in dish is like a little paper tray, red and white check paper tray with chopped barbecue in it, uh, coleslaw and a square of this, of the family's homemade cornbread, mm. uh, which is very minimalist cornbread. Very, very simple, but the flavor of the barbecue, you just can't beat that wood cooked flavor. And unlike most places, um, it, people are starting to do this more and more in, in sort of I- imitation or, or homage to, to Skylight Inn, but they actually take the skin from the pig and they chop it in with cleavers into the meat. So you get these little, Almost crisp little smoky bits uh, mixed in there. So well, I thought really that was a amazing. I thought that was a point of contention between Sam Jones and his dad. They didn't want to do that at Skylight. So when Sam opened his, that was like the first thing he did was mix in the crispy skin into his barbecue. No, they've already mixed it to the skin in. I think the big point oh. of contention between um, Skylight in and Sam Jones barbecue, which is on the list as well, somewhere down in the, you know, not too far down, somewhere in the twenties, I think, um, Sam Jones, which is about a 10 minute drive from Skylight Inn. It's a little town called Winterville. Yep. Um, it was over serving beer oh. and that was sort of the, the, you know, Skylight Inn, n- no beer at all. Uh, Sam Jones, a much more large format restaurant and they do other things, but no, I think chopping them, unless I'm mistaken, well, they, they definitely chop it in at Skylight Inn. I think that's always been the, the, the way their family has done that. Uh, the serving of the beer was the thing that almost, I, I think, you know, drove the family apart, but they, they've since reconciled. I understand. Uh, let's jump to number three uh, for the sake of time. Dreamland barbecue. I have to say, I'm shocked. I'm shocked that it's this high because I've heard reviews from all sorts of people and most of them are not glowing. So what makes number three Dreamland Barbecue? All right. Well, A, number one, uh, it's Dreamland in Tuscaloosa, the original Dreamland Barbecue. Dreamland's now a chain. Uh, they're all over Alabama. I think a few in Georgia, perhaps, maybe some down in Florida, but there's about a dozen of them and nothing against the other ones. I, I, you know, I'm not going to run them down, but the Dreamland in Tuscaloosa is special, and that's the one that, that, that made the list. Uh, it was on my list last year, but it really rocked it up this year. <laughs> I went back down there this summer, and I don't know. I mean, it's something about walking in the place and sort of the, the atmosphere itself. Uh, it's this low red building. It's been there forever. It's dark. It's, it's such a classic University of Alabama uh, football shrine. There is stuff all over the wall. So to begin with, you got the great atmosphere and then the food comes out. And um, when you first sit down, they bring out like white bread and like a little thing of sauce, this warm and a little, and a little cup. And then whatever you order, out comes the ribs, out, out come the sausage. And it's a really simple menu. If you go to the other dreamlands, they have a bunch of other stuff on the menus, but, but there it's pretty much ribs and sausage. And I think they have pork as well, but, um, and it's just fantastic. It, it's, mm-hmm. it's a unique style of rib. Uh, I, I think of it as Alabama style ribs. They're cooked on these big brick pits, 
but unlike you know offset ribs cooked in Texas, which are which are great, but it's just a different category of food. The uh, the Alabama rib is cooked hot and fast mm. on this big brick pit about you know two feet above a roaring fire, and they actually have a hose that they will use to squirt the fire. So you got flame coming up. We're not talking about offset, and they they cook them in. I don't even know how long. It's, it's very quick, you know, an hour or so to, to cook the ribs. But they're still, they're tender but chewy. They have a great texture to them. And I don't know, this this time around, something about going to Dreamland just really struck me. And this was back to back on a long trip. I went ate a lot of places. Like, this is really special mm-hmm. and it's it's really delicious. And I keep thinking about if I had to go you know, to this place or that place, this place or that place, it kept bubbling up mm-hmm. until it, it landed at number three. Number two is Fresh Air Barbecue. I'm not familiar with Fresh Air. Yeah, Fresh Air, um, again, moved up the ranks. I think it's been in my top 10, uh, a longtime favorite, but I hadn't been there since before the pandemic. And another, that type of thing where you pull up the side of the road, Fresh Air is, it was found in 1920. Uh, it hasn't changed much. If you talk about, um, people will say, what's Georgia style barbecue? I always say, well, go to Fresh Air. That's Georgia style barbecue. There's differences here and there, but, you know, there's, there's no chicken on the menu. There's no brisket on the menu. There is barbecue in the menu, which means pork, and it's chopped pork. It's cooked on its op- L-shaped open brick pit. When you first mm. walk into the restaurant and you walk into this little porch that has uh, uh, sawdust or wood shavings lined it, and, and in the old days, apparently, the, the, the wood shavings were inside the restaurant until the health department started frowning on that. But you still walk across that to get in. You open the door, and as soon as you walk in, you just it's just hickory smoke or, or, or hardwood smoke. And there's a giant L-shaped brick pit right behind the counter where they're cooking everything. Wow. Uh, it's got the best Brunswick stew I've ever had, um, which is a, a Georgia classic. And so everything, every single thing about it is is exactly what you would want a uh, – uh, I rest of the bee. And, and for me, it's a, the iconic representation of, of Georgia barbecue. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been, and I, I couldn't stop thinking about it. So it, it, it landed at number two. Number one has been number one at various points through the Texas monthly list. And that is Snow's Barbecue. Why number one? Yeah, first time it has made it to the number one slot on, on my on my list. And um, I had to admit, um, the previous number one, which we didn't talk about, was Scott's Barbecue. They're, they landed at number five number this five, year. Right. Uh, fought Scott's in, in Hemingway. There's a lot of Scott's on there. But the original Scott's Barbecue in Hemingway, still a fantastic restaurant. Uh, it sort of hurt me to have to put a Texas spot in the top list as a South Carolinian. However, <laughs> I have to say that, um, yeah, I went to Snow's again. Um, and th- it hurt me for a lot of reasons to put it at the top because you, you, they, they open at 8 a.m., which is insane. Uh, that's when the doors open. What other barbecue opens at 8 a.m.? So, and the people, now that Tootsie was on the whole Netflix, yeah. uh, Netflix show, I mean, she's an international barbecue celebrity. Um, while I was standing in line, I was standing in line next to people from Minnesota, a whole crowd of them who were sort of on this barbecue pilgrimage they had flown to texas and were eating it and then i ran to these guys from mexico is a, you know, a bunch of competitive barbecue cooks from mexico uh, uh. um who had come to to uh to eat at snows as well so i mean that's that's quite a meeting and the people from just all over um but the line's insane um and uh you know it it, it gets i got there it was still dark uh, got in the back of the line and waited four hours to eat. So normally this would be a bad thing uh, in, in my my book. But what Snows has done in, in in the recent incarnation used to be you would wait. They have a, a little building where you go, the, you know, order your barbecue and they cut you in the line would just sort of build out. And they had like a porter john, uh, you know, for the people who are waiting in line for a long time. And you sort of waiting like sort of gravel, grassy gravel lot. Uh, they built a little um house to be a, a bathroom you know to have bathrooms people wait in line they added like a, a a free bar where you can get free beer and free bloody mary's which really helps take the edge off it's a gift shop there but then the line now wraps around the back of the cooking shed mm-hmm. so while you're waiting you can uh sit there and um you know see all the action going on see tootsie cooking see clay cowgill who's the, the main uh pit, pit guy now uh working all the big pits and, and see everything and it's just it's almost a uh, it's such a fun atmosphere mm. and then finally uh you get it up there in the bar he's fantastic so i had you know since i'm really this time around i was saying the food's super important but the experiences is too and the two of those really came together for me it snows and they're they're number one if you want to see the whole list, you can go over to robertfmoss.com and right at the top of the website, you're going to be linking over to Southern Living Magazine. You can review the list and then 
feel free to email Robert all of your, you missed this, this one should be higher than this one, this one should be dropping lower than that one. I'm sure he's happy to take them, or maybe he's going to be taking a vacation from all social media and emails over the next couple of weeks. I, I'm currently in hiding in a secluded location uh, with, with no no social media. I will say, though, I've visited every single li- place on the list multiple times. It very much reflects my preferences and personality. Um, we can argue f- f- till you know about places and who made lists who should have, but I think you have to agree that you know if you look at all fifty of them, it's a pretty damn good list of uh, of places to go eat. Yeah, no doubt about it. And fifty places I would certainly like to go across the South. And we're talking with Robert Moss here. Robert, always appreciate the time, and we'll see you in October. All right, thanks, Greg. You got it. So if you agree with that list or disagree with that list, you can't argue with the fact that Robert continually puts himself out there and says, look, I'm the one putting the list together. I'm the one that visits the restaurants. Here it is, like it or not. And that's what I like. It's not popularity contests or any nonsense like that that a lot of people like to do these days. Or going on uh, TripAdvisor and devising a list like that. None of that. He's doing it, and he's putting it out there, offering it out there, all on his own, going out on that wire. All right, we're going to step away real quick and come back, wrap the first hour. We're already late, and then we'll get back and caught up for our second hour interviews. So stick around. We'll be right back. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. So we thank Robert Moss for joining us last segment, robertfmoss.com, his website. In case you want to go over and check out that top 50 list that we were talking about just a few moments ago. See what you agree with or disagree. And remember, this encompasses the South. Now, somewhere Maryland also is allowed to be in the South. I wholeheartedly disagree with that. Remember, uh, Kentucky is also being included in the South somehow. So whatever the South is to Southern living, that is the list which represents the South. All right, we are going to step away so we can go to the top of the second hour, and you will stick around, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. 